Okay, in this problem, we need to graph the rational function, negative 2x over the quantity x squared plus 1. And knowing that many of the features of that graph will be revealed by the first and second derivatives, let's go ahead and compute those now. So first, we'll write down the function in question, perhaps in this case naming it f of x, and then noting that f of x is a quotient, we apply the quotient rule to find its derivative. Doing so yields the bottom guy times the derivative of the top guy minus the top guy times the derivative of the bottom guy, which of course here should just be 2x, all of that divided by this bottom guy squared, like so. This can of course and should be simplified. And so doing that we get this, but now notice we have a negative 2x squared and a positive 4x squared that should collect together. So let's go ahead and put those together. Now as we compute our original function, the first derivative of that function, and the second derivative of that function, we will want to have each of those expressions in completely factored form. The reason for that is the interesting features of our graph often occur where these expressions are equal to zero or undefined, and having them in a factored form will make such locations easier to identify. So with that in mind, trying to factor the numerator here, the bottom of course is already completely factored, we can pull out a common 2, and then upon doing that we recognize hopefully that x squared minus 1 is a difference of squares and can be further factored into the following. Now we turn our attention to the second derivative. Of course to find the second derivative we need to take the derivative of the first derivative but which expression we use is up to us. This one right here is particularly suited to an easy calculation since the numerator is just a nice small polynomial, so we might try to use that one. Just remember that the second derivative ultimately needs to be in a completely factored form if we can get it that way. So applying the quotient rule to this expression, we find the derivative is the bottom guy, times the derivative of the top guy, which of course here would be 4x, minus the top guy, times the derivative of the bottom guy, which notice is a composition, so the chain rule applies. We'll need to bring the 2 down to the front, dropping the exponent by 1 to get this, but then don't forget to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which would be 2x, like so. Of course, all of this is over this bottom guy squared. Now, just as before, we want to get this to a simplified and completely factored form. But with that in mind, let's not multiply all of this out right away, because notice we already have some common factors identified. We have an x squared plus 1 on both of the terms in the numerator. We also have a 4, and we also have an x there and there. So let's pull those things out now because if we multiply this all out factoring is going to be much more difficult. Okay so again we've pulled out the common 4, the common x, and the common x squared plus 1 that is present. Now I just need to build this expression back up. What do I need to multiply this by to get our first term? Well it looks like it's only missing an x squared plus 1 so let's go ahead and add that back in. And then for the second term it looks like we're missing just this 2x squared minus 2. So we'll put that back in as well. Now the remaining simplifications can be done really in one step. Notice we have a common x squared plus 1 in the top and the bottom, so we can cancel one of those, giving us this much. And then looking inside the brackets up here, notice x squared minus 2x squared will be a negative x squared, and 1 minus a negative 2 will be a 3, so it looks like we have 3 minus x squared here. Now this is sufficient. We have this in a completely factored form. I suppose you could take it a little bit farther if you wish. You could factor the 3 minus x squared, although it doesn't factor neatly, uh, into square root of 3 plus x and square root of 3 minus x. But again, we just need to be able to determine very quickly where this expression is 0 and or undefined. And I think by looking at 3 minus x squared, we can tell that that factor is going to contribute a plus or minus square root of 3 when we consider when it might be 0.
So we'll leave it like this for now. Now remember, the whole point of this was that when the second derivative, or the first derivative, or the original function is zero or undefined, we generally have something interesting happening in the graph of our original function. So let's find out at which x values that occurs. Where are these things, zero or undefined? In order to keep our work nice and organized, let's lay out three lines, one for each expression, like so. Now, let's consider the first line, the original function f. Where is this zero or undefined? Well, remember that a fraction can only be zero if the numerator is zero. And this numerator can only be zero, in this case, if x itself is zero. And so we'll mark that on our line. Now, what does that mean graphically? Well, our function is then zero high at this x value. If we are zero high, we must be sitting right on the x-axis which means this represents an x-intercept. So we'll mark that as well. Now, what about the original function being undefined? Could this expression be undefined for any value of x? Well, it will certainly be undefined if the denominator is equal to zero. However, in this particular case, since the denominator is x squared plus one, or something squared plus one, notice the something must always be positive, notice our denominator is always bigger than or equal to one itself and thus is never zero. So we won't mark any additional points on this line here. Instead, we turn our attention to the first derivative. Here again, looking at the factored form of the first derivative, it's easy to tell where the first derivative might be zero. We again just need to look at the numerator. Where is the numerator equal to zero? Well, when x is either one, making this factor zero, or negative one, making this factor zero. So we'll mark both of those on our green line here. Now, what's the graphical interpretation at these two points? Well, if the first derivative is equal to zero, then that's telling us the slope of the tangent line at that x value, or this other x value, is zero, which means we have a horizontal tangent line. So let's indicate that on our line here. I would also normally be interested in where the first derivative is undefined, but just like we saw in the original function, this denominator here may never be zero, and consequently, this expression is never undefined. So we have no additional values here to mark on this line that corresponds to our first derivative. So let's move on to our second derivative. Where is this expression equal to zero or undefined? Well, to find out where it's equal to zero, we again look at the numerator, and here we find that if x itself is zero, that will make the entire numerator zero, or, as we mentioned earlier, if x is either the positive or negative square root of three, that would make this factor zero and hence the entire numerator zero. So we'll mark all three of those points on our line. One thing we want to be very careful about as we lay out both the numbers on this line and the ones above it is that these things are aligned with one another. In other words, this zero should be directly underneath this zero. I know that one, in terms of its value, falls between zero and square root of three and so graphically here, one should line up somewhere in the middle of those two values. This is going to make putting all of this information together much easier to do when it comes to finally drawing our graph. Now, what's the graphical interpretation of these three points? Well, if the second derivative is zero, we at least run the risk that these are points of inflection. But we don't know that for sure. A point of inflection is a point where the concavity changes. In other words, the second derivative changes in terms of its sign. I will need to know the sign of the second derivative to the left and the right of each one of these points before I can determine if they graphically represent a point of inflection. To make sure I know all of the places where the second derivative could change sign, I also want to, as I did with the expressions previous, I want to know where this expression could be undefined. But again, looking at the denominator, we notice x squared plus one is always bigger than or greater than one. And so once again, uh, we don't have any additional points that we need to mark on this line, as the second derivative is always defined. That leaves us ready to look at the signs of each one of these intervals. And it will turn out useful to do the same for the intervals above and even way up here at the top. And the process is pretty much the same for all three. 
we want to know where this expression here is positive or negative. Consider each interval in turn. For example, if I'm way over here to the left of negative root 3, and you can pick a representative value if you wish to make this analysis a bit easier, say negative 1 million. And I go down here and I look at each factor, notice this factor would be negative, 4 times negative a million. This factor, 3 minus negative a million squared, well that's very negative too, over negative a million squared, so far we're positive, plus 1, that's still positive, cubed is still positive, it looks like we have a negative times a negative over a positive. That product, of course, has to be positive. So let's mark that. The graphical interpretation, of course, being if the second derivative is positive, our graph must be concave up, or cupped up. Let's mark that as well. Okay, and then we can do the same thing for the remaining intervals. If we're between 0 and negative square root of 3, let's say negative 1, for example. This factor again is negative, while this is now positive, 3 minus 1. And the bottom is always positive, so it looks like the product here, being negative times positive over positive, is negative. So we'll mark that, and note the graphical interpretation this time, since the second derivative is negative, is that the function should be cupped down. Notice this sine analysis process hinges on the fact that we have something in factored form here. Moving to the next interval, let's say we use a test value of 1 since it falls between 0 and root 3. Now this factor is positive. 3 minus 1, that's also positive. The bottom is always positive. So it looks like the second derivative should be positive in this interval. And finally, if we plug in a very large value, something uh, beyond root 3, this is positive, this is negative, notice, 3 minus a big number squared, over a positive, and so once again our product must be negative. So we'll mark that. With the sign analysis complete, now we can say with certainty whether or not these three points are points of inflection. Notice the concavity changed as I went from the left of negative square root of 3 to the right of negative square root of 3, so this is indeed a point of inflection. So let's label it accordingly. And the other two points follow suit. Again, going from negative to positive and positive to negative. We can do a similar thing for the first derivative, identifying in which intervals it is either positive or negative as well. Looking at the interval between negative infinity and negative 1, if I examine the factored expression for the first derivative, Notice both this factor and this factor are negative, while the bottom factor, of course, is positive and will always be so, given this square right here. But that makes the entire expression positive in this interval. So we'll mark that. And in a like manner, we can consider this interval between negative 1 and 1. Maybe 0 is a nice convenient test value for us. Notice this is positive, this is positive, this is negative, and again, the bottom is always positive because of that square. And so the overall product is negative, so we'll mark that. And finally, to the right of 1, it looks like this is going to be positive, this is going to be positive, the bottom is positive, the entire product is positive, and so we'll mark that. Now, we just need to interpret graphically what we've just discovered. When the first derivative is positive, recall that means our function is increasing. So I'll indicate that on here. Likewise, when the first derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. Applying the same to the last interval, we see the function first increases, then decreases, and finally increases again. 